Welcome. My name is Shannon Sweat, and this will be the Unit 5 hearing for the We the People Nationals Final Round. Congratulations on making it to finals. In a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves to you, and then you will each get a chance to introduce yourselves to the judges. Students, you will then deliver a four-minute prepared speech and 10 minutes of follow-up questions. My microphone will be muted, but I will be holding up your one minute and your time signals for you. I suggest that if you're viewing this, you go ahead and use gallery view rather than speaker view. And at the conclusion of the hearing, our judges will give some feedback. Judges, when you're ready. Lovely, thank you. Good afternoon, Wisconsin. My name is Gus Chin. I'm a municipal judge for the city of Holiday in Utah. And I'm looking forward to our conversation and discussion this afternoon. Um, and uh, good afternoon, city of Maryland School of Law. All right, and hi, my name is Ben Glickman. Uh, I'm an attorney with the California Attorney General's Office, uh, but much more interestingly, uh, I am an alumnus of this fine program and was at the national finals uh, way back in 1995. So congratulations on making it to the final round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please introduce yourselves. Good afternoon. We are, we are the juniors of Unit 5 from Wallachus West High School, the Wisconsin State Champion. My name is Kira Kirby. I'm Thomas Hipke. I'm Maya Lee. I'm Indigo Key. And we are here on behalf of our teaching assistants, mentors, and teacher, Mr. Chad Mateski. Lovely. Thank you. The question is number two and reads as follows. Ninth juror, the facts are supposed to determine the case. Tenth juror, oh, don't give me any of that. I'm sick and tired of facts. You can twist them any way you like. Know what I mean? Ninth juror. That's exactly the point this gentleman, he indicates the eighth juror, has been making. Why are juries required to render a unanimous decision rather than a majority decision in most criminal cases? To what extent, if any, do jury trials ensure due process as stated in the Constitution and Bill of Rights? To what extent, if any, do jury trials reinforce founding principles? You may begin, please. In a 78 minute speech before Congress, Jane Madison stated, trial by jury cannot be considered as a natural right, but a right resulting from a social compact. But it is as sense of the people to secure the liberty of the people as anyone that praises the rights of nature. The importance of trial by jury has been almost universally recognized since the founding of America. However, many issues and procedures pertaining to jury trials have been put under the microscope. In particular, the resulting verdicts of the trials. Unanimous verdicts are required in criminal cases in order to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, better ensure all perspectives are heard, maintain the power of jury nullification, and, most notably, increase the likelihood of an impartial trial. In Ramos v. Louisiana, the Supreme Court held that the Constitution requires unanimity in jury verdicts in both state and federal criminal trials. Ramos argued that his conviction on a 10-2 verdict violated his Sixth Amendment right to a trial by an impartial jury. First incorporated to the states in Gideon v. Wainwright, prosecutors must prove a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The unanimity requirement ensures that even if one juror entertains a doubt, the defendant will not be deprived of his life or liberty. Benjamin Franklin's notion that it is better a hundred guilty persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer is reflected in the requirement of unanimous verdicts. Although unanimity may allow some guilty persons to go free, it lessens the likelihood of an innocent person being deprived of their natural rights. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments guarantee that a person cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Jury trials are one of the last and most important of these procedural steps. By requiring a jury trial, the Constitution ensures that the government does not act unfairly in its assessment and punishment of an accused individual. Instead, the peers of the accused act as a check on the power of the government and are ultimately the ones who decide if life, liberty, or property can be taken from him or her. Additionally, many of the other due process rights are connected to the holding of a trial. During Prohibition, many people were prosecuted for violations of the Bullside Act. However, means for the defendants were tried by a jury of their peers, according to the Washington Post. 60% of prosecutions resulted in acquittals due to jury notification. This was the people's way of retaining their, their liberty against an unjust law. In pre-revolutionary America, the colonists used jury trial rights 
to protect themselves against oppressive British rule as seen in Rexy Zanger. Despite the prosecution's proof that Zanger had violated the law, a colonial jury concluded that Zanger was not guilty, thus preserving his liberties. This dependency allowed citizens to limit the government's power, maintaining popular sovereignty as a bulwark against an arbitrary and capricious government. The very act of jury service reinforces many ideals of democracy. In Federalist 51, Madison referred to the people as the fountain of authority. As it pertains to jury trials, the people exercise this authority when they decide whether a person's liberties can be taken away. Madison's views align with the founding principle of consent of the government. In order for the government to have any power over its citizens, they must first consent to the government's rule. As citizens enter into the social contract, they agree to give up liberties in return for order. For the government to deprive a person of life, liberty, or property, the people must have the final say through a trial by jury. The importance of trial by jury for the Democratic Republic is irrefutable. The power of the citizens over the government helps maintain vital checks and balances that guard against tyranny. As John Adams said in 1774, representative government and trial by jury are the heart and lungs of liberty. Without them, we have no other fortification against being ridden like horses. Thank you for our statement. We're ready for follow-up. Thank you. Your testimonial suggests that you're a strong proponent or supporter of jury nullification. If so, if a jury ignores the law as given by the judge, should the judge not have the authority to overrule, overturn that jury's verdict for not following the law as given? Why or why not? No, the judge should not be given this as Jury nullification often comes from often comes from the the jury thinking the law is unfair. And as MLK said, an unjust law desert is is no law at all. And um, if we if the jury is acting based on this, then there is no reason why the judge should overturn such decision. Many times the judge will not have a say in the laws that are passed. And so the people through jury nullification, as in prohibition, are able to uh, act out against laws that they find um, unjust against them. Although I do agree with my colleagues, I believe that if the judge believes that the jury did not understand the law properly, then they should have the authority to overrule. Let me uh, push back or just make sure I understand. Um, is it, I guess, would you agree that you and I may disagree about whether law is just or not? Yes, I do believe people with different perspectives from different places in life can disagree about what laws are just and what laws are unjust. However, so, that's- So let me, let me, so if that's so, I mean, your, your position assumes that only, that the only laws that juries will seek to nullify are unjust laws. But I'm assuming that you'd only be in favor of it if you agree that those laws are unjust, right? And if, for example, someone was a racist and didn't think that people of different colors should have the same rights and therefore attempted to nullify equal protection laws, you wouldn't think that was really very great, would you? That is one of the reasons that a court requires unanimous verdicts is because the one pe person swaying, being able to sway the whole jury in 11 to 1 verdicts mean that that person could sway the whole jury or could sway the way that it goes. Unanimous verdicts requires everyone to agree and that if everyone doesn't agree, a trial can be declared a mistrial and then be retried by a separate portion of jurors. In Ramos v. Louisiana, Justice Sotomayor argued that less than unanimous decisions were based on racism, as, as my colleague was saying, that the one, if there was an 11 to 1 um, verdict, as she was saying, that if one of, if it was based on race and the one defendant was, or the one um, other vote was a black or other minority, that their vote wouldn't count and on a less than unanimous ruling. I wanted to shift gears a little bit. I mean, one of the challenges with jury nullification is we don't know why the juries make their decisions because we don't get to go in that jury room. We don't, we're not, jury deliberations for the most part are confidential. Do you think that is a good policy to keep jury deliberations confidential? What are the pros and cons of it? 
I do believe it is good as if we were to open up these jury deliberations to everyone, then there would be no stopping from the jury being able to become biased as there would be a widespread public um, widespread public media of the jury deliberations. And there is no doubt that the juries would thus see that. I agree with my colleague in the court case Remmer v. U.S. The court decided that if a jury had any outside bias or information, that it could ha- heavily sway the jury and it could lead to not an impartial trial. In England, there was star chambers where the um, British had secret courts and they were able to um, have bias in their courts. However, I do not think that there is danger in having um, private juries as these people are not um, working under the government and they are citizens. If they open up jury deliberations to the public, it could then put the jurors in potential danger of being scrutinized by the public as if the decision isn't widely spread, agreed by, by the community, then they could be put in some form of danger. Right, but an if, example if, of something if, that like, can I interrupt? It, but but I guess what if a juror is in the jury room, you know, spouting off racist comments or making clear that they're they've been bribed or some set of egregious facts that that really taint the fairness of the trial? Don't we have a right or an ability to know that? Doesn't the defendant have a right to know that? It is the responsibility of the other jurors to uh, exercise their civic virtue in making sure that the that the one juror and their biased thoughts cannot um, influence the rest of the jury. And that if they are influencing, it is based on the evidence that was heard in court and not any personal biases. As stated in Federalist 51, if all men were angels, no government would be necessary at all. And this this relates to original sin, which can then which um, states that which provides the notion that there that every person is inherently um, is inherently unjust. And if we go by this, then no person within the court. That is why the court consists of 12 people and not just one, whereas which provides for um, more opinions within the jury, thus providing a more fair trial for the defendant and the state. I'm going to ask you a different question, if you don't mind. You, you promote unanimity. If the jury is unable to reach a unanimous verdict, should the judge compel them to continue working and give them a certain instruction until they reach or able to reach a verdict or they're at a point where they cannot? In California, they, um, in California, when they, when a jury cannot reach a decision, the judge after two mistrials is able to make a decision as to whether the defendant is, or is able to release the defendant to, um, without charge. Right. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're not talking mistrial. We're talking when the trial is underway, the jury is deliberating, and they send the note to the judge, they cannot reach a verdict. Should the judge be able to compel them to continue to work at it to get to a unanimous verdict? In a sense, yes. The judge should be able to ask the jury to reconsider and even if need be, re-explain the rules that he has set out or the laws that this person is being accused of violating or even be able to go back and look at some evidence that if the jury had not understood it as well as they might have the first time, they can now understand and re-deliberate. Another way that this could, um, another way that um, jurors could have um, helped with um, not re- with um, reaching a less than unanimous verdict uh, is having um, them ask the judge questions. For example, in Rittenhouse v. Wisconsin, the jurors were able to ask, or in, sorry, in uh, the Kim Potter case, the jurors were able to ask um, the judge if they could hold the gun and see the weight of the, the difference in the weight between a gun and a taser. Additionally, they asked the judge what to do if they could not reach this consensus. However, this could be seen as a concern as it will be putting as it could be putting too much power into the judge's hands, which would then be leaning towards a system that would put too much power towards the government, which was one which was one of the fears of the anti-federalists. What about um, what about civil cases? Should there are you in favor of unanimous juries in uh, in civil cases? 
Yes, I am personally in favor of unanimous decisions in, in civil cases as um, fundamental rights, such as the rights of parent, as established in Troxel v. Granville, can be taken away in civil court. I would disagree as um, in civil cases, it is often not a, it is often a deprivation of property rather than liberty or life. And therefore it is not as great a deprivation as your life being taken or being put in jail for 20 years. However, deprivations such as large amount of money can severely inhibit someone's life and can lead to their life getting worse. And so I do believe in unanimity in uh, civil cases because of the deprivations that could be much larger and could be said to be equivalent to some in those in criminal cases. Uh, we only have a, a less than a minute left, but plea bargaining is the way most criminal trials end or, 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 or something short of a jury trial. Do you think that has undermined the importance of the jury and are there any changes uh, that you would recommend? One change I would recommend is um, when plea bargaining, lawyers often bump up charges to make plea bargaining easier so that they can draw back their charges when bargaining with the defendant. And if we were to um, disallow this and not allow for this ramp up of charges, then plea bargaining off would not take place as often as the defendants are not as often facing trial for such hefty crimes. Thank you. Well done, Wisconsin. I appreciate your tolerance and patience as we interrupted you trying to get through questions. We want to make sure you had a full feel of where we are trying to find out your, the level of preparation. You held yourself well in terms of your testimonial. Your responses were passionate. Slight, uh, I'm not sure that you got Judge Levy's question regarding the issue with nullification. I let him address that further because I think you went slightly afield, but nonetheless, you addressed the issue of nullification. The jury deliberation and the compelling of a jury to reach a unanimous verdict is commonplace in some states, not in all, but certainly you were responsive to that. Your preparation is indicative of your commitment to the issue of civic responsibility and your responses are indicative also of your ability to bring about change because you have some great ideas. So I hope you put those ideas into practice and bring about the changes you desire for the future of our country. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Gertrude. So, um, so I enjoyed the, the give and take. Um, this was a nice way to end our day. And um, I don't know if you think that our questions to you were a nice way for you to end your day, but, um, but we certainly enjoyed it very much. And um, we, um, you, you, Present very well. You're earnest. You, um, you, you know, you sort of stick to your guns. Um, I don't know that any of these questions necessarily they didn't really seem to take you by surprise, um, which is a is a testament to your own preparation to your teacher. Um, you're, you're well drilled. You're, you're working. Let me state the obvious. You've been working incredibly hard um, to prepare for this, and it, it shows. Um, so it, that, you know, that can be its own reward. Um, as on, look, on nullification, here's the problem. Um, nullification, it's always possible to point to, you know, this case or that case. Um, a lot of times we hear, you know, nullification of the Fugitive Slave Act or um, uh, uh, prohibition. But the fact is that given that, um, Given the fact that, for example, r racism or, or homophobia or misogyny is still um, unfortunately endemic within many people, the risk is that most of the time jury nullification um, will, will not be in favor of the home team, you know, if you will. Most of the time jury nullification um, will be to just ignore when the judge says, 
you have to decide this case, you know, just based on the facts and without taking anything else into account. We don't want jurors saying, well, I don't care what the judge told me. Um, th these people, they're, they're all criminals. So I don't care what the facts are. I'm just going to decide that based on that. Obviously, none of us could be in favor of that. And so nullification is if you really sort of think about it. It's, it's mob rule and it's lawlessness. And while occasionally we say, oh, gosh, I'm glad they ignored that law. Most of the time, we, we want jurors to follow the law because, you know, for reasons that I, I need not further belabor. So that's sort of where my question was going. That's what I was sort of trying to push the buttons on. Uh, but nonetheless, I did appreciate the fact that you, you stuck to your guns. You didn't, you know, you didn't let me bully, you know, push you around. Um, and that, that is, that's very admirable, as is just in general, um, your whole presentation. So thank you. Good luck, like I say, this was a great way to end our day. Yeah, I would echo all of that. Congratulations uh, to you and to the rest of your class on, on finishing up the We the People. I know it's a bittersweet moment because it means you're done, right? Um, <laughs> but but know that you equipped yourself uh, very well in your last round. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed our conversation. I think a lot of our questions in, in our dialogue really showed the challenge of some of these issues, right? Like, like Judge Levy was saying, you know, nullification is very much at best, a double-edged sword, uh, uh, and so it's a difficult thing. And I think similarly with the uh, whether or not we should pierce uh, jury deliberations to know what's actually going on in, in in the room. You know, there are benefits to the secrecy, but there there could be downsides to it as well. And and I think you guys kind of highlighted some some of those tensions. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have a lot to add. I think you you know you supported uh, your positions well, and you stuck to your guns and and like has been said that whenever we pushed you, you were ready to respond and, and didn't back down. And so you should be very proud of yourselves and uh, best of luck in the competition. Thank congratulations, you. Congratulations to your teacher and to your parents. Boy, they must be so proud of you guys and they have every reason to be. So if they make your parents proud, then that's a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.